Hello everyone and welcome to Really Old Movies. I'm your host Harrison Scullin and today I'll be discussing the next director in my director series, George Cukor. And these are five films from his filmography that uh, most of which I've never seen before and I've just put them in ranking order of worst to best. And I'll be giving kind of a short review of each of these films. And so yeah and make sure if you're not already to hit the like button and hit the follow and uh and hit subscribe rather so you can follow me for updates on new episodes and new live streams that sort of thing so i'd really appreciate that but yeah now let's get started talking about the director george cukor all right so we will read a little bit about his biography so george dewey cukor was born july 7th in 1899 and died in january 24th 1983. he's an american film director and producer he mainly concentrated on comedies and literary adaptations. His career flourished at RKO when David O. Selznick, the studio's head of production, assigned Cukor to direct several of RKO's major films, such as What Price Hollywood, A Bill of Divorcement, Arbetters, and Little Women. When Selznick, when Selznick moved to Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer in 1933, Cukor followed and directed Dinner at Eight, David Copperfield, Romeo Juliet, and Camille for Irving Thalberg. He was also replaced as one of the directors of Gone with the Wind, but he went on to direct The Philadelphia Story, Gaslight, Adam's Rip, Born Yesterday, A Star is Born, Bowani Junction, and won the Academy Award for Best Director for My Fair Lady in 1964, which was his fifth time nominated. He continued to work into until the early 80s. So so these are just some of the films that he's well known for, and I think some of you have heard of before for sure. And uh, some of those actually end up on this list today. Talking about his directing style, Cukor quickly earned a reputation as a director who could coax great performances from actresses and became known as the woman's director, a title he strongly resented. Despite this reputation during his career, he oversaw more performances honored with the Academy Award for Best Actor than any other director, James Stewart in Philadelphia Story, Ronald Coleman in A Double Life, Rex Harrison in My Fair Lady. One of Cukor's early um, ingenuities was... Ingenues? Ingenues, I think is what it is. I'm sorry. This is all from his Wikipedia page, by the way. Uh, one of his earlier ingenuities was actress Catherine Hepburn, who debuted in A Bill of, Ador of Divorcement in 1932, and whose looks and personality left RKO officials at a loss as to how to use her. Cukor directed her in several films, both successful, such as Little Women in 1933 and Holiday 1938, and disasters such as Scarlet's, Sylvia Scarlet 1935. Cukor and Hepburn became close friends off the set. And so now talking about the Gone with the Wind scenario here, he was hired to direct Gone with the Wind by Selznick in 1936, even before the book was published. He spent the next two years involved with pre-production, including some supervision of the numerous scene te screen tests of actresses anxious to portray Scarlett O'Hara. Cukor favored Hepburn for the role, but Selznick, concerned about her reputation at the time as box office poison, would not consider her without a screen test and the actress refused to film one. Of those who did, Cukor preferred Paulette Goddard, but her supposedly illicit relationship with Charlie Chaplin, they were in fact secretly married, concerned Selznick. Between his Gone with the Wind chores, the director assisted with other projects. He filmed this cave scene for The Adventures of Tom Sawyer in 1938, and following the fire, firing of its original director, Richard Thorpe, Cukor spent a week on the set of The Wizard of Oz from 1939. Although he filmed no footage, he made crucial changes to the look of Dorothy by eliminating Julie Garland's, Judy Garland's blonde wig and adjusting her makeup and costume, encouraging her to act in a more natural manner. Additionally, Cukor softened the Scarecrow's makeup and gave Margaret Hamilton a different hairstyle for the Wicked Witch of the West, as well as altering her makeup and other facial features. Cukor also suggested that the studio cast Jack Haley on loan from 20th Century Fox at the Tin Man. So those are kind of my thoughts on his directing style and just gives you a little insight into his career 
he definitely had a great relationship with Catherine Hepburn. She actually appears in several of the movies on this list. So without further ado, let's talk about number five. And that is My Fair Lady from 1964. So let me share the synopsis from the film's letterbox page. A snobbish phonetics professor agrees to wager that he could take a flower girl and make her presentable in society. And so this is Audrey Hepburn, actually, no relation at all to Catherine Hepburn. And to me, I did not like this film. I gave it a three out of five. I thought it was pretty boring. But the costumes and set pieces were amazing. Some of the music, but honestly, it got super dull after a while and it was just so long. It's about three hours long, so um, I don't think it needed to be personally. There's some scenes that could have been cut. There's a scene with uh, uh, I can't remember her name, but Audrey Hepburn's character's dad, where it's like a super long song that he sings. It's like that song does not need to be there. There's just several, several moments where I was like, this is way too long. I really think it could have been trimmed down significantly. And I believe it's based on a play, if I'm not mistaken. Um, okay. I, I'm just not a fan of everything about this. So, yeah, I uh, three out of five. <laughs> and, and I know this is a beloved film in the classic film community, but I don't know. Just for me, I couldn't jive with it. It just... It didn't work for me. I, I wasn't a huge fan of it. But again, the costumes are amazing. I mean, look at the, this one here. This is incredible. But it was just way too long. All right. So now we'll move on to my number four, which is Little Women from 1933. And so here we see Catherine Hepburn here. And I think this is one of her earliest roles, if I'm not mistaken. It definitely... Uh, solidified her career for a while because it was a very very popular film and so let me talk about the synopsis from the film's letterbox page so little women is a coming of age drama tracing the lives of four sisters meg joe beth and amy during the american civil war the girl's father is always serving is away serving as a minister to the troops the family headed by their beloved marmy must struggle to make ends meet with the help of their kind and wealthy neighbor Mr. Lawrence, and his high-spirited grandson, Lori. So yeah, it's kind of... If you've ever seen movies like Pride and Prejudice or read books like that, this is pretty much what this is. This is like the American version of that, I would say. Because it shows, you know, the girls when they're in about teenage years and then just kind of the, the lives they live near the, um, you know, during the war and then at the end of the war. I, I want to say it takes place over 10 or 20 years almost, but yeah, I thought it was a great film. I gave it a four out of five. Um, it, it also reminded me a lot of uh, uh, Downton Abbey. If you've ever seen that, there's a lot of drama in that. Th this is a film like that, where there's like moments where everything is going so well. And then other moments where things are falling apart. And I think a great example of that is actually the death of one of the sisters. Spoiler alert. Um, who's kind of like the angelic one. Everybody else, all the sisters have different personalities. Like Catherine Hepburn is the very spunky, outgoing, kind of tomboyish character. Um, oh, let's see. Meg, she's the older sister who's like proper and wants to live in high society and looks down on Joe's antics. Amy, she's like the baby sister. She's an artist. She's very creative, but also kind of a troublemaker. And then Beth, she's just, like I said, she's like the angelic sister that they all look up to, even though she's one of the younger ones. And just when her death occurs, it's like a very tragic moment in the film. Um, and then, yeah, just kind of the best of times, worst of times for these for these girls and their family. You know, it's just a crazy film. I loved it. And I really think Catherine Hepburn is the best part of this film. To me, she's the best best actress and best character. Um, you know, they were teenagers at the beginning and I wasn't a huge fan of that per se. I liked it when they're a little bit older, but I just did like that. Uh, Joe's character arc is she starts as being, you know, very everyone. We have to stay together. You know, we can't leave each other to at the end of the film. She kind of grows up and learns. No, this, this is actually even closer way is, um, learning to, you know, move on and, grow and become 
individuals, you know, they're not a collective per se. So no, I love that. And uh, yeah, four out of five. It, it was a great film. I highly recommend it. Okay, so now the next film, or number three, is Pat and Mike from 1952. So this film is one of nine of the Hepburn Tracy films where, that they made from the 1940s all the way until uh, Spencer Tracy's death in 1967. And this is one of the more famous and popular ones. And so let me share the, the synopsis from Letterboxd. Pat Pemberton, played by Katherine Hepburn, She's a brilliant athlete, except when her domineering fiancé is around. The ladies' golf championship is in her reach until she gets flustered by his presence at the final holes. He wants them to get married and forget the whole thing, but she cannot give up on herself that easily. She enlists the help of Mike Conovan, played by Spencer Tracy, a slightly shady sports pro promoter. Together, they face mobsters, a jealous boxer, and a growing mutual attraction. So yeah, I think that's a great synopsis of the film right there. Um, it really shows off the athleticism of Katherine Hepburn. I didn't know this beforehand, but she actually played tennis every day. I think she played golf a lot too. She was really, really talented uh, athletically as well as, as an actress. So I was really impressed with that. And I thought it was a great film. You know, I love their chemistry together. I thought it was hilarious. He's always kind of like the, I would say like the, barking like kind of grumpy guy and then she's you know the happy um go lucky like outgoing type of personality i thought they meshed really really well together and you could tell they had real chemistry because behind the scenes they actually did for many many years so i love that and again the tennis scenes were amazing she was really really talented and i played tennis in high school so i was very very impressed with that um, I myself am nowhere near as good as she was, but it was just really cool seeing actual tennis being played in a movie because sometimes you can kind of tell if they're not good or not. But no, she was really, really good. So I, I love that. I gave her four and a half out of five. It was a great film. Um, It's a nice, fun watch. Maybe like a lazy Sunday afternoon type of a watch. It's very wholesome. I, I love that. It's a great film. Okay, so now number two is The Philadelphia Story from 1940. Once again, Katherine Hepburn. So let me share the synopsis of the film from Letterboxd. When a rich woman's ex-husband, played by uh, Cary Grant, and a tabloid-type reporter, played by James Stewart, they turn up just before her planned remarriage, she begins to learn the truth about herself. I, I think that's a good synopsis of the film. I've seen this film... I want to say two or three times now. I think it's a funny, hilarious film. I love Katherine Hepburn in this role. She plays like a socialite, Heidi Tidy up in New England area. You know, the, the very proper and whatnot. Great character there. And Cary Grant, he's hilarious. She's her ex-husband. And I, I just love their chemistry together. But it's almost like the anti-chemistry because they're fighting, fighting. More like a realistic couple, right? But I loved it. They're great. James Stewart's great. Um, this was before he went into World War II, so he played in a lot of comedies, actually, before he did dramas like It's a Wonderful Life. So it's fun seeing him here being a little silly and slapstick. And yeah, just all around, it's a great film. I highly, highly recommend it. It's really one of the funniest movies I've ever seen. And uh, yeah, I... I first saw it a couple of years ago because I have it on VHS and it, it's amazing. I, I loved it so much. Uh, anything else I want to add to that? I did a review of it. I don't know if it was on this channel though, but yeah, it, it was, it, it's a really fun film. It's great on rewatches. It gets even funnier. Uh, yeah, I, I highly recommend it. Four and a half out of five is what I give it. All right, so now we'll get into the number one overall. So drum roll, please. Gaslight from 1944. So when you read the synopsis of this film, this sounds more like an Alfred Hitchcock film than it does George Cukor. Like I was mentioning earlier, he was known for screwball comedies and book adaptations. This is actually a book adaptation, and so is uh, uh, Little Women. Those two are both adaptations. I don't think any of the other ones are, but... 
yeah, this definitely fits in that category. So let me read the synopsis. A newlywed played by Ingrid Bergman fears she's going mad when strange things start happening at the family's mansion. And her husband tells her she's going crazy. So, yeah, that's a pretty good synopsis of the film. Kind of a simple story, but really, really tense. I mean, as far as I understand, the term gaslight, I think, does come from this film. Um, or at least this u- the use of the word, right? So, yeah, I, I loved it. I gave it a five out of five. It's incredible. You know, I think it's very underrated. I don't hear many people talking about it. And, you know, I love Charles Boyer. He's the husband here. He's very devilish and very conniving. And I love how charming he was, too. It's like, oh, no, dear, you're just you're just going crazy. You know, it was insane the way he was treating her. And I think Ingrid Bergman definitely knocked it out of the park. You know, she she deservedly won Best Actress in this role. You know, you kind of feel so bad for her. She's like, oh, she has to get out of this situation. But how? You know, this guy, he's very smart, very conniving. But once it all resolves, it's a huge relief at the end. But yeah, I loved, loved this movie. One of my favorite movies ever. And again, I think Warner Archive released it, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, I of the films here, I recommend this one especially because Again, I I don't hear anybody talking about it. So check it out. It's a great uh, thriller if you're into thrillers like Alfred Hitchcock films. And also, if you want to see kind of a period piece too, this takes place in the 19th century where there are gas lamps and whatnot. So yeah, it's really, really cool. I loved it. Five out of five. All right. So those are the five films from George Cukor's filmography. So let me backtrack here. So yeah. I I think I'll keep checking out more of his films. He's got some great comedies. He's got some great uh, dramatic films like Little Women and uh, Gaslight. And even if I didn't like My Fair Lady, again, I can't ignore the amazing costume work that was done in that film. So yeah, I thought this was a great director and a great filmography. All right, so the next director in the series is Michael Curtiz. And my hope is to have this be live, but... Again, work and school kind of get in the way. So this one might be pre-recorded as well, just like this one is. And maybe I'll keep doing that for the time being. I'm not sure yet. But that will be released September 16th at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So stay tuned for that. All right. Well, thanks again for everyone for watching today's episode. And again, make sure to follow me on YouTube, Rumble, and also on Instagram at Really Old Movies, where I discuss details about Uh, week's particular film because i review individual films every single week and uh, new podcasts are released saturdays at 8 p.m pacific standard time and again thanks again for watching this has been really old movies i'm your host harrison skull and take care